All right, so I think we're ready to start whenever you are, Myra. Um, I'll introduce you first. Um, I am Chris from the Newburgh Free Library. Uh, I'd like to welcome Myra Armstead from Bard College, who is going to be talking about her book, um, Freedom's Gardener, about the life of John F. Brown. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a bit of a transition for us doing Zoom programs rather than seated programs but we're really appreciative of presenters like Myra for their flexibility in offering programs in this format. So without further ado, Myra, if you're, are you all set? I am all set. I'm, I'm about to share my screen. All right, awesome. Okay, and then, um, okay. So let me get rid of, all right. So everybody sees what I see, right? James F. Brown, uh, who lived from 1793 to 1868. Uh, I'll be talking about what I'm calling tonight the informal and formal politics of association. Um, the, I start with the year 1829 because um, let me just back up and say that I met James, I like to put it that way, in 2005, I was doing some consulting work for Mount Gulian Historic Site, which is across the river from you, and discovered that they had a diary of the man who served as their gardener, and that that man was African American. And right away I was hooked. So I began researching a book that um, took me seven years <laughs> to put together. The diary that he kept is started in 1829. Um, it went to 1866, but the things I'll be talking about are in this period. Um, so it's before the Civil War. Um, so let me explain what I mean by the politics of association. Oops, let me get over here. Um, when James Brown uh, was born, the United States was a brand new country. And as um, time moved into the early 1800s, the early 19th century, uh, the United States was very much a marvel or a place of interest for Europeans. Uh, they were very much interested in this experimental democracy, the first modern democracy ever. And there were a lot of people who came and um, took notes, Europeans. And one of the most famous was Alexis de Tocqueville, who famously wrote this two volume work called Democracy in America. He was a French aristocrat who was sent um, by the French government to observe the American penal system that was starting to um, emerge. And um, he took a tour in the 1830s and um, just started noting everything he could possibly note about this new society. Um, and it resulted in this two volume book, Democracy in America. And one of the observations that he had that um, is probably the most famous had, has to do with what um, uh, have been called voluntary association. So here's a line from it, Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dispositions constantly form associations. And what he meant by that was what we might call clubs, um, uh, organizations uh, surrounding any cause that interests us. And this was remarkable to him because in Europe, where uh, there were, uh, you know, there was a nobility and, a, and, and an aristocracy, typically, you know, if you had such societies, um, they were started by someone who was an aristocrat. And uh, the people who were involved were wealthy. Um, but here in the United States, anybody who was interested in anything, um, one of my favorite, uh, clubs during this period was the Society for the Promotion of Faithful Service Among Domestics. Um, you know, you could, you could start it. So what I want to talk about tonight is the extent to which James F. Brown participated in this associational life, which we call today our civic sphere, 
you know, the way in which we engage in um, public life um, and which was being pioneered at the time. So let me tell you, um, I'm gonna try to get through several different um, uh, directions in which he went. Uh, Anti-slavery, evangelical, temperance, horticultural, firefighting, orphan asylum, fraternal associations, burial, burial associations, and then um, his political affiliation, which was the Whig party. So um, that's a lot. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna condense it. James F. Brown was, um, we don't really know where he was born, but I can say this, um, and we can, I can answer uh, questions about where he was born in the Q&A, but here is Frederick, um, Maryland. You see here, um, at the time he was born, it was called, ooh, it just disappeared, Fredericktown. He had a master named, he was born a slave, and he had a master named um, William Williams, who had a, a kind of a spread out there, oops, and then who took him to Baltimore, where he also had a townhouse. Um, and um, he escaped from Baltimore. Oops, it keeps disappearing. He, he escaped from Baltimore. And um, I, I'm i gonna read you a letter he wrote before he escaped. And um, I hypothesize that he went from Baltimore somehow on, or another over to Delaware and then made his way up, up to New York. But um, he was involved in anti-slavery activity. And uh, we know this um, because of uh, correspondence that emerged. First of all, Baltimore was a really lenient place to be a slave. It, it was known as Freedom's Port because it was easy for slaves to pass as free. I could answer questions about that later. He was not. He was, um, he was promised his freedom by uh, his master's brother. So the master who brought him to Baltimore died and um, passed him on to his widow. Uh, and um, the widow then loaned him in some way to her brother-in-law, her deceased husband's uh, brother. And um, as you will see from this letter that I'm going to read, somehow or another this brother-in-law um, promised James his freedom, but the lied. And uh, when James went to his mistress, his the 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 wife of uh, his former owner, um, who now literally owned him, um, and tried to bring this up and win his freedom, she refused. So here is a letter, and I can answer. I know the question that you're asking right away is like how could he write? <laughs> um, and that was another mystery I had to uh, answer. But anyway, he wrote a letter which I call his intent to run away letter. Uh, August 1827. He's writing this from Baltimore. I know that you will be astonished, sir, and surprised when you become acquainted with the unexpected course that I'm now about to take a step that I never had the most distant idea of taking, but what can a man do who has his hands bound and his feet fettered? He will certainly try to get them loosened by fair and honorable means. And if not, if not so, he will certainly get them loosened in any way that he may think the most advisable. I hope, sir, that you will not think that I had any fault to find of you or your family. Now, let me stop to explain that, um, very often in urban areas in the South, what owners did with their slaves was hire them out. Um, you know, slavery at, at root was an economic uh, prospect. It was about business. And in cities, owners very often uh, found that they didn't have as much need for as many slaves. So they would hire their slaves out. It, basically that was renting the slave to someone else. 
Um, so that's what Susan Williams, his mistress had done. Um, and James at this point is writing a letter to the man that he is hired out um, to, to say, basically, I'm running away. Um, hired out slaves usually had a contract for a year that was um, drawn up with the consent of the master. Uh, the hired out slave usually was paid um, wages uh, and those part of those wages went to the master or mistress. And uh, some part could be negotiated for the slave to keep for himself um, and eventually buy his freedom. So anyway, um, so he's he's writing to the you know his hired out employer slash master. Um, so um, I had uh, I don't I don't want you to think I had any fault to find of you or your family. No, sir, I have none. And I could have lived with you all the days of my life if my conditions could have been in any way bettered, which I entreated with my mistress to do, but it was all in vain. She would not consent to anything that would ameliorate my condition in any shape or, or measure. Um, skipping towards the end here, before I was married, I was promised my freedom. So there he's referring to um, some document which I have not been able to locate uh, in the Williams family papers. But he says, before I was married, I was promised my freedom and he, he says, see this piece of writing which you will find enclosed and we haven't been able to find it. I was then confident that I was free at Mr. Williams' death and so I married. I must now beg for your forgiveness and at the same time pray to God for your health and happiness as well as that of your family. I am, sir, your most obedient servant, Anthony Chase. So, um, you know, he talks about how he's gonna run away, you know, he says, um, there's mention of going to Delaware and he makes his way from uh, Delaware to New York City where he is employed by the Verplank family. The Verplank family was a Dutch descended um, family of some social and political prom prominence um, in the 1820s in New York. Um, this was their home in well, uh, Wall Street um, and apparently they hired him as a waiter and uh, someone noticed him, someone who knew the Williamses and let Susan Williams know. She then began a correspondence with Daniel Cromlin Verplank. Um, and she, at this point had relented and said, I just wanna be done with the business. So Daniel helped negotiate uh, a kind of settlement. And from what I've been able to um, gather from the diary entrances, because there's no direct um, mention of this, uh, over a three year period, um, James won his freedom. And I can answer more questions about that. And he eventually was taken up to Fishkill Landing uh, across the river from um, Newburgh which uh, was what Beacon used to be called. And uh, he became a servant in this household of the Verplanks, which is um, Mount Goulian today. Uh, the house looks a little different from that sketch because it um, was, there was a fire and it was uh, rebuilt. Okay, so he somehow or another participated in anti-slavery uh, causes. From the correspondence between Susan Williams and Daniel Verplank, we know that there was uh, someone named Mr. Needles, uh, who was a Quaker. The Quakers were um, ahead of the curve um, in the 19th, uh, 18th and 19th century in supporting abolition. There was a Mr. Needles who uh, was in Baltimore, uh, a white Quaker, furniture dealer who was very friendly with Benjamin Lundy, who was a more well-known Quaker abolitionist who had a newspaper called The Genius of Universal Emancipation. And Needles and Lundy um, were, uh, were partners in, in abolitionism 
uh, when Needles would get orders for furniture, he was a furniture maker uh, down south, he would pack the drawers with abolitionist literature and send it down south. So um, Needles was a point of contact and um, from other sources, I am conjecturing that um, it was the Newland family that was a connection to Dutchess County. There was a Quaker family, the Newlands, uh, Cyrus Newland, who had property both in Dutchess County and Fishkill and in Delaware. And uh, I, I believe that uh, James was able to make his way north to the Newlands um, and from the Newlands got in contact with the Verplanks. So anti-slavery activity in that way and then um, there were all sorts of evangelical societies from the first uh, Bible distribution society to um, tract societies. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. This was um, a, a new development in the early 20th century. There was a revival movement, uh, the date for which uh, the, the starting date is, is, is contested, but probably around 1800, that kind of swept the land. Um, the, the church that was the most uh, involved in this was the Methodist church, but it really hit all Protestant denominations. And what made this unique is that it was a new kind of theological understanding of uh, Christianity and how one entered it. So if you were high church and liturgical, you entered the church at baptism um, upon birth and somehow or another you kind of inherited um, your salvation. If you were Calvinist from New England, uh, it was decided by God through predestination. But this new evangelicalism fit this experimental new country that was in the process of self-making because under the evangelical conception of salvation, it was up to the individual to decide um, whether they would, he or she, they would um, accept Christ. And this, this whole idea of the uh, evangelical preacher ending the sermon with this invitation was, was all new. So this was very much a part of um, the, the um, uh, sort of new imagination of uh, the United States. And um, um, James was very much a part of this. We see this in the, the diary in that uh, he is uh, connected with Bethel AME Church uh, in Baltimore. It, uh, Bethel AME Church in New York. These are, uh, this is the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And by definition, the AME Church was anti-slavery. So um, in emphasizing the agency of the individual to um, make, uh, in this case, his fate, you can see an alignment with his decision to self-liberate. I'm, I'm going to, to leave. Um, Okay, so I have here a picture of um, um, a sketch of what the uh, evangelical camp meetings and revivals look like. You see the, uh, the minister very emotionally calling people to make a, deci a decision. And um, here you have someone mourning. It usually brought people to tears. This woman is fainting, you know, at the momentousness of this decision. Um, here's um, uh, a similar revival meeting uh, among uh, a Black population. And um, James went to all kinds of churches. Um, he actually is buried in uh, St. Luke's uh, in, um, in Beacon. But um, he, in the diary, you see that whenever there was a camp meeting of the AME church in Newburgh or because um, they came up in the summer, he would go. Um, he also would attend white evangelical camp meetings. He would go to um, the Dutch Reformed Church. 
um, as well as um, Episcopal churches. And um, this very famous church, um, Broadway Tabernacle, which was built by um, Dwight, um, not Dwight Moody. Um, mm, oh my gosh. Um, the name is just escaping me. Moody is the late 19th century revivalist. It's, uh, oh my goodness, it'll come back to me. It's been a long day. But um, this was a very, fin Finney, oh my goodness, Finney, um, Charles Finney, Charles Grandison Finney. Uh, so um, he built this on Broadway and it was a huge um, draw. And uh, in the diary, you see that uh, James, who very frequently takes the steamboat back and forth to New York City, uh, goes to visit. And in fact, uh, there are other churches he mentions, and when I trace them, they were always anti-slavery churches. So he's involved in um, this sort of evangelical movement, uh, which emerges anti-slavery activity with sort of self-liberatory um, activity, self-making. Connected to that, of course, would be um, his involvement with the temperance movement, which emerged um, in the early 19th century. Now, that is of a piece with evangelicalism and agency and salvation, because just as you chose, once you chose um, to be a, a follower of Christ in this way, Evangelical religion called for you to engage in a lifelong work of, of, of self-sanctification um, before God. So you were always examining yourself, trying to perfect your, your morality. And this had a spillover effect in society. So the early 19th century is known as the first age of reform. So we get all kinds of new voluntary associations and causes emerging. Um, infused with um, the kind of passionate uh, attention uh, of their members, many of whom were um, evangelical in this, this particular sense. So um, penal reform, um, how should we treat uh, prisons? How should we build prisons in this new age? Um, um, you know, the first women's movement, um, suffrage movement, um, the Fourier socialism, uh, vegetarianism. I mean, there are all kinds of refractions of, of, this of, of this perfectionist impulse. So a lot of these, uh, the leaders, you know, have a kind of base or some kind of um, conversion experience and it takes them in all kinds of directions in terms of trying to um, improve society. Um, some which are more orthodox and some which are less or orthodox and some which are you know, decidedly secular, but it all sort of stems from this same well. So um, here we have, um, you know, a bunch of early temperance ladies and, uh, you know, this was probably female moral reform society and one of their strategies was to turn up at saloons and try to shame the men um, found there. Um, you know, here's a tract for um, a temperance society meeting at a church. And, um, you know, sketches, this is the, an era in which the print industry publishing takes off. It's, it's headquartered in New York and, you know, the, all sorts of illustrations. And this is a sort of a famous one, the, drunk, the drunkard's progress. And there's this arc um, of devolution, you know, so you sort of start with just a, a light drink and then you're, you know, sort of partying with friends all the time and then, um, by the time you get here, you commit suicide, right? So um, he, in the diary, oh, this is, oh no, let's go back. So, oops. Okay, so um, I just thought I'd read a little bit about his involvement in, um, in, in temperance because um, for, for black people to be involved in the AME church was, was, was big um, in this 
um, initially, um, th this idea of drinking was equated with slavery while temperance was likened to freedom. Um, but temperance also had a, a kind of racialized dimension. Um, the fact that there were so many Northern evangelical abolitionist reformers that promoted it, made it um, uh, attractive uh, to, to, to many blacks and that there were so many um, uh, Southerners who did not. <laughs> um, so Southern support for temperance was minimal. Um, and um, also there was a way in which uh, temperance as it was um, promoted was about um, exercising discipline and the desire of free blacks at this particular time to engage in what has been called the politics of respectability um, to um, basically uh, push back against claims that um, they did not deserve their freedom, that they needed the tutelage of whites, that they would not be responsible, um, meant that temperance would be attractive to, to Blacks. So in James's diary, we see that if he isn't a member of a temperance society, and I can't tell, uh, from time to time, he mentions going to temperance meetings um, in and around Fishkill. He's also involved, he becomes a master gardener. Uh, he starts out as the coachman uh, when he, uh, I'm sorry, he's, he starts out as a waiter in New York City. He's brought up to Mount Gullion where he becomes the coachman. And then uh, after a few years in the diary, you see that he's doing nothing except gardening. And uh, this is the recreated, um, uh, ornamental garden, um, which you can see in the summertime, uh, that he and Marianna Verplank, um, who was the maiden mistress of the house when her brother Gullion was away, um, designed together and, and maintained. So he became, and this uh, part of this early 19th century horticultural movement, that was another uh, cause you begin to have in the Hudson Valley, the appearance of horticultural societies. This is, I just threw this up as um, the Massachusetts Horticultural Society's building. Um, the Massachusetts Horticultural Society uh, early on maintained its own magazine. Although the New York Horticultural Society really was the first one. It got started in 1818 um, and uh, a local Newberger, if, is, if that's a word, uh, was very much involved in this. Andrew Jackson Downing, whose first career was as a proponent of horticulture. He started um, a Hudson Valley Horticultural Society. And um, I can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A, but um, James F. Brown knew him. The diary uh, shows him going over to, um, uh, to the Downing's uh, nursery. Uh, Downing uh, eventually marries the daughter of, of, of uh, Peter DeWint, who is the neighbor of the, uh, of the uh, Verplanks to the south, immediately to the south. And there's a kind of partnership that I argue that uh, Brown and um, Downing had until about 1841 when um, Downing has a magnificent showing at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, and um, which was started in 1827. And from that point on, Downing develops a different career, which is that of landscape, um, gardening and architecture. So he's very much involved in that. He showed at the shows, he won prizes. He also, um, rather surprisingly to me, was a part of the firefighting community in Newburgh. Now he, he wasn't a, um, a fireman, but the diary mentions him going to firemen's suppers and firemen's balls. And that was very surprising to me because um, 
fire, volunteer fire fighting was um, pretty segregated. It was one of the areas that became quite segregated very early on um, as uh, particularly as ethnic groups, particularly the Irish um, used this as a way to establish their identity and their importance in uh, emerging urban society. Um, but, you know, in trying to make sense of his association, um, there are a couple of things. First, James, the, 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 the black population upstate was very small. Um, he regularly goes back and forth to Newburgh and that's very clear in the diary, he's doing that all the time. People in Fishkill walked across the river all the time in the, um, in, in the cold weather and they did their major shopping. Anytime there was like some big thing going on, um, he would go across the river uh, to get clothing or uh, you know, to make major purchases for the, for the river planks. Um, so, uh, and he also enjoyed their patronage. So that could have put him in a, an unusual spot. So the, the small critical mass of blacks and the fact that he had the patronage of the river planks um, provided him with a certain amount of entree. But the other thing is that firemen's associations allowed men to display their manhood. Um, and so for Brown, I would argue the, uh, the largely domestic and sort of semi-private displays of restrained manhood that he could exhibit through you know, the church and temperance meetings and Bible societies were supplemented by his involvement with the Firemen's Association as a form of what historians call martial manhood. Um, so um, we can, again, talk that out. In other words, you know, the parades, um, this was all a kind of performance of, of manhood as well. Um, he was involved in early children's state. So these are just some sketches from the period of volunteer companies and, um, you know, my point about manhood, you know, here we are fighting the fire, saving the city, saving children, saving babies, and we're doing it publicly. Um, everybody can see it. Um, so, okay. Um, so I don't know how many of you saw Hamilton, but <laughs> one of the things that, uh, uh, now it's Eliza, yes, is known for starting an orphanage. Well, there were there was as part of this, I would say, perfectionist age of reform, this effort to show one's goodness um, in starting these new associations. And one of them was a colored orphan asylum. And it seems that James was involved with that um, in a couple of ways. From the diary, it's really clear that from time to time, he and his wife, uh, who had no children, would take in children of friends for a while. Um, these were not exactly orphans, but um, the situations of their parents temporarily uh, call for the kids to have um, some kind of guardianship. In one case, his um, niece uh, has, is married and the husband goes to see um, and uh, we, he comes back, but at some point he goes out to California and we don't hear from him anymore. Um, the, the, the daughter, uh, the, 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 the only child that uh, that, that couple has died, uh, uh, the mother, I'm sorry, dies and the child has to be cared for. And that's where we see that he, you know, he gets involved with the, um, Colored Orphan Asylum and push and puts the child there. We also know that he was friends with the um, the Varick family. The Varricks founded the AME Zion Church in New York, um, in New York State. And uh, Emmeline Varick Bastine uh, was on the board of trustees, which was unusual. She was African American. Um, so James is involved in that as well. A couple of others. Um, that's the 
asylum burning. So fraternal societies as well, um, besides the uh, uh, Prince Hall Masons, which was the, probably the best known of the, uh, the black fraternities, uh, fraternal orders that were started. Um, there were several others and um, we don't have clear evidence that James was a member. I haven't seen that in any, in any records, but he does mention in the diary that um, he did attend events uh, of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, um, which was an all black uh, uh, fraternal order. It distinguished itself from the American Independent Order of Odd Fellows, um, but it did benevolent and charitable work on behalf of its me members. And um, the the founder of it, Peter Ogden, was a black sailor in New York. And um, from the diary, we know that James F. Brown um, had friends who uh, worked at sea. You know, his as I just said, his. His niece married someone who was a sailor. And in that intent to run away letter, I um, skipped over the portion where he says, I'm going to run away and I'm going to go to sea for a while. Well, he doesn't really, I don't know if that was a decoy. He might have taken some quick jaunt somewhere. Um, but um, I think that explains the logic of him joining the Odd Fellows. Um, just a couple of other things quickly. Um, this is just a map of where the uh, African burial ground uh, in lower Manhattan was found. Um, during this period, um, there were separate uh, burial grounds for African-Americans. And there is some debate in the literature as to um, whether how much of this was um, the decision of white owners to separate blacks from themselves and how much of it was um, sort of self-generated that African-Americans, particularly in the colonial period, wanted to um, secure their own burial rights and their memory of um, African burial rights. Uh, what I found surprising about James F. Brown is that he gets involved in starting a um, burial ground here in um, the Hudson Valley. And it's right after the niece that I mentioned passed. He saw to it that that niece was uh, buried in Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery, which really surprised me because apparently it was integrated or maybe it had a section for Blacks. I haven't found that. Um, but immediately after that happens in 1851, um, you know, he buries this um, niece uh, in um, the summer. And at the end of the summer, uh, there's a local meeting to buy a black burial ground. And James is clearly at the center of it. Um, he starts soliciting funds and, and the diary says, um, on behalf of the colored people of Fishco Landing and vicinity. So I don't know if that went across the river or not. And very quickly by late October, you know, so he starts this at the end of August. And in the same year by late October, they secured the money for the, uh, what was called the Colored People's Union Bury Burying Ground. And I found the records of this in the Dutchess County Deeds uh, Office it seems that he got the um, property from uh, John Peter DeWint, again, the neighbor to, to the South. Finally, I wanted to mention his involvement in the Whig Party. Um, so the Whig Party was um, the leading national party uh, that opposed the Democratic Party in the second uh, party system in this country. And it was in existence from about 1834 to 1856, um, or 1854 kind of uh, fizzles out. And, uh, you know, in the next 
uh, in a couple of years, the Republican Party emerges. Um, the James Brown, uh, the, the, the Democratic Party is not friendly towards black people at that time. So, you know, the, ideal, the ideologies of the parties have, you know, has flipped considerably um, over the, the, the decades. Um, but at this time um, of the two parties, the Whig party was the most friendly to the concerns of of black people, um, free blacks who were pushing for their civil rights before the Civil War. Um, this was a very, very small, tiny minority of blacks, most of whom were enslaved. But in the diary, there's this wonderful entry, um, and I'm just gonna read it. Um, James Brown wrote uh, November 8th, 1837, and you can see why I wanted to end here. It's very timely. He wrote, the election at Fishkill took place this day, at which place James F. Brown voted for the first time. Um, he very often referred to himself in that way. Um, um, third person? Yeah, I had to think about that. <laughs> uh, so he, he's very proud of that because um, it was not easy for a black man to vote um, first of all, to have gained his freedom, and then in New York State to vote in 1821 during the uh, so-called age of the common man or the emerging democratization period where property qualifications were removed uh, for white males to vote in New York State, they were imposed on African-Americans, uh, $250. And so the fact that he had, um, advanced, quote unquote, to the point of freeing himself. Um, as he said in that letter I read at the beginning, what is a man to do? He, mu he will lose himself by any means possible. And um, having worked, and then you know he, he worked to become a master gardener and enjoyed a comfortable life that was sort of like having a skilled craft. At the time he became a property owner and a voter. And it's very clear in the diary that he was an avid partisan, um, you know, recording every Whig victory and all the meetings that he attended. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, just say that um, in all of these ways, James F. Brown was, in, was able to participate in the civic sphere and he did so, um, I think very uh, uh, enthusiastically. For him, it was an expression of freedom. In my book, I talk about three kinds of freedom um, that he experienced and which were at, uh, uh, that, that, that were contentious and co controversial uh, during his time. The obvious issue of freedom as a legal state versus um, slavery. Um, he overcame that. Then there was freedom of um, economic freedom. Um, um, as the factory system emerged uh, and sort of set laborers adrift um, to become uh, free labor, quote unquote, uh, they countered that this was actually wage slavery. But James apparently overcame that. Um, through his success uh, in his craft, horticulture. And so finally there was freedom, um, which was exercised in the civic sphere um, through this kind of um, multifaceted activity to have some influence on the shape of American um, public life. I hope I haven't talked too much. <laughs> No, that was great. Um, so now I'm going to ask people to unmute. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Thank you for such a great presentation, Myra. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Alternatively, if you don't want to ask the question yourself, you can type it in the chat box and I'll ask it for you. Was he married or um, bring his children with him? 
Uh, he was married. Uh, he, in the diary, uh, he, first of all, he ran away. I should, let me just read you this one. So you, you, you see that he says that he, he was promised his freedom in Baltimore. And so he went and decided to get married. And I did go and look that up and found his marriage record. He records the marriage in his diary. But in this letter before he left, he wrote a PS. People will say that my wife has persuaded me to do this, uh, to this, but I do declare that she is innocent of anything of the kind and was always opposed to anything of the kind. And that's because he's leaving and he doesn't want anybody to, uh, to punish her. Okay. Uh, he does come back and get her and they don't have any children. Uh, although I was, the two of them don't have any children, but I was really surprised at one point in the diary where he says, out of the blue, received a letter from my daughter-in-law or something like that. And it's like, where did she come from? <laughs> so, um, uh, that might have been before, you know, he might have had a child before he married. Thank you. We have no pictures of him, which is really sad. Were there any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. I'm sorry. I my Wi-Fi kind of cut out when you were talking about horticulture and, and downing. So I was wondering if um, James designed any gardens or or did landscape architecture at all. Um, I I don't think so. Um, I know that he was very close to Mariana, but actually that garden was laid out. When I think about it. Um, the garden itself, if you go to uh, Mount Gullion, you know, this was an ornamental garden. Um, and he mainly uh, was in charge of, well, actually he was in charge of the garden. Um, but uh, let me think, let me think. Um, mm, mm, I'm just, he, I can't say that for sure that he, you know, actually laid out a garden, but he was conversant with um, Downing. He was more a gardener, okay, than a landscape gardener. That's, that's the uh, most direct answer. Although he would have been um, privy to conversations. Um, you know, there's the, the diary and um, entries include um, things like went to, to Armstrong's or went, uh, he went down to uh, uh, Wodenoth, um, William Sergeant Winthrop's um, famous garden um, further south, but it's in Fishkill. And um, so he, you know, he knew what a beautiful garden looked like. What I really hoped was that he was, you know, that he knew some of the other black gardeners that I've been able to find in the area in the 19th century, but no smoking gun. Where can we buy your book? Oh, it's online. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's not, if you want to know about landscape gardening, uh, you'll be disappointed because <laughs> he does not do that, but I think not much. He's really into just the gardening. There's a lot about uh, just the mechanics of gardening. Um, you know, every March, uh, the entries are um, hall dung. You know, he went to fix a, a greenhouse pane. He went across the river and bought a heater for the garden, um, that kind of thing. Uh, were there any other questions? Great. Um, if not, I just want to thank you again, Myra, for a great lecture. This is really interesting. And thank you for everyone who attended. Um, I'm going to put our link oh, we have a, um, in the mm -hmm. chat for our website. If anyone wants to go and look at more upcoming programs we've got uh, as part of our Harriet Tubman series. 
And thank you again, everyone. Hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you again, Myra. You're welcome. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you.